<laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Kate. Okay, so good good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here um, at the Sassy Cafe, um, our first one of the 2024-2025 um, academic year. So we're very fortunate to have uh, Blessing Usaro with us uh, this evening, who's going to be talking to us about all things cybersecurity. Um, I had the good fortune to meet with Blessing last year at the Women in STEM Awards. Uh, where her non-profit um, company Cyber for Schoolgirls was sponsoring one of the awards. So that was great and um, she very kindly then agreed to come on and kick off Cybersecurity Month with us uh, today in SESI. So Blessing has a wealth of experience and knowledge in the area of cybersecurity and she is an information security expert. She has ex experience developing and managing security solutions for large-scale enterprise across a range of different industries and furthermore, she has a rich and uh, informed background in the areas of telecommunications, security operations and risk management. I'm sure she'll be going to lots more detail for us <laughs> in, during her talk. Um, as a woman in a STEM field, especially in cybersecurity, Blessing is very passionate about diversity and inclusion. And she's actively working to address the complex problem of uh, closing the gender and skills gap in the Irish cybersecurity industry. She leads Cyber Women Ireland as well as running Cyber for Schoolgirls. And Cyber for Schoolgirls is a pro program for secondary school students, which she'll tell us more about in due course. So blessing, you're very welcome to our first SE Cafe of the year. And um, I'm sure that I speak for everyone when I say that we're very much looking forward to this session. And um, so before I hand over the floor to you, John, is there anything extra you'd like to add or? You're on mute, John, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll talk at the end for the next session, okay? Perfect, that's so, no problem at all. Thanks so much. So blessing the floor is all yours. And when we're finished, we'll have a Q&A session then um, amongst the, the SESI members that are here. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, everyone. Um, I will just share my screen and uh, we will kick off. Super. If you've any issues, let us know. Yeah. Let me know if you can see um, my screen. Can't at the moment now. Oh, yeah. OK. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I'll just we can I'll mute myself now so you're done. Okay, thank you. Okay, great. So I'm gonna be conscious of everyone's time. Um I know I have 20 minutes, so um I will try and get through as much as I can. So um thank you for this. Hello everyone, it's really a pleasure to be talking to the very esteemed community of computers and education society. Um as Jennifer said, I'm Bless Nosor. I I'm currently a principal information security engineer, and I'm also the founder of Cyber for School Girls. I do a bit of public speaking, keynotes, and also traveling. Um, I recently completed my second master's in Solvay Business School in Brussels, and I'm also an alumni of University of Limerick, where I had my first master's in information and network security eight years ago. Um, also, I've been lucky enough to be in rooms as Jennifer um, and won a number of awards as well. Um, I also sit on the Dublin Business School Advisory Board for their ICT department, basically helping them to create the better curriculum that prepares the next generation of the workforce in Ireland for better employment chances. So um, what is cybersecurity? I'm going to give a few minutes and uh, I want a few people on the call today to just tell me what comes to mind when you hear of cybersecurity. If you don't mind putting your comments in the chat, it will be great. Okay, run somewhere. Next frontier, okay. It's good, online caution, keeping the device safe, okay. So we all have the right idea of what cybersecurity is about. It is definitely complex as well, and it is about protecting your data. So very simple and short description of what cybersecurity is. It's a practice of protecting computers, like the ones we're on. Computers could be your mobile phone, your iPads, your Fitbit wristwatches, your Apple watches, um, your Apple tablets, networks, networks when we're in the office, and also your data, again, on your laptop, on your mobile device, on your Fitbit watch, on your Apple devices, your Apple watches. That's what cybersecurity is all about. It's about protecting all of that data that is stored on a technological device. 
So the first comment was ransomware. Again, which is a really great point. Um, ransomware is, I will say, one of the top four, which I've listed out here, top four cyber attacks that we're facing um, individually and also as an organization as well. So take, for example, um, you're working on your computer and then suddenly a message pops up saying your files are not locked and you need to pay money, you know, to unlock them. Or you have a case where it's like you're in your classroom and then someone comes in and takes your teaching notes or your teaching materials and then they lock them up and you say, I'm not going to give this back to you until you pay. That's the real idea of what ransomware is. And that's literally how it works. The key idea is that the attacker is going to block access to an important data that you need until you pay an amount of money or you give them something, which most times is in payment. Social engineering sounds technical because of the word engineering, but it's as simple as they say the old man's trick. And social engineering, really, you can look at it like a student pretending to be a parent on the phone and asking for private information about the classmates. The goal here is to make the victim believe that the person on the other side of the phone is legitimate, so they lower their guard and they provide valuable information. And one of the most dangerous things about social engineering is that it plays on emotions like trust, fear, or curiosity. You know, for example, you're again in the classroom and someone calls you pretending to be the IT department, and then they ask, a teacher or you, the teacher, to reset your password. You're like, you know, I'm going to send you a link and, you know, I want you to reset your password because we're doing an IT refresh on all our systems. And then you're like, okay, I'll be waiting for the link. They send you the link, which is obviously and actually a scam. But the main purpose of them sending you this link is so that you can go through the process of clicking the link, putting in your credentials, and they steal that credentials. This usually happens with fake emails text messages, or even websites that you believe could be real or are not real. Fishing. Fishing is another popular one. And just as the name fishing is literally fishing, trying to catch a fish. In this case, unfortunately, human beings are the fish. For example, you receive an email that looks like it comes from your bank. It could be the AIB, it could be Bank of Ireland, and they're asking you to verify your account details. However, then the, the link takes you to a fake website. But let's remember that this fake website looks like the bank website. So it's like all the logos are there. Everything looks the same, right? And then you click on it, you enter your information. It asks you to put your internet code. It asks you to put your IBAN number. Literally every single thing that you would have to put on the legitimate website, it asks you to do the same thing. And then this information goes right straight to the scammer. Unfortunately, this is prevalent right now in, in today's world. Phishing has now gone into, you know, the, the aspect of even text messaging as well, where you would receive text messages that would say things like your Amazon order is on the way, but it's been held by customs or even unpost text message. I can tell you for sure that myself, I've received loads of unpost text messages saying, oh yeah, you know, you need to pay the customs fee for this, click this to pay two euro custom fee. And it looks like a very small amount of money, but then think of a thousand people sending two euros to that one scammer or that one attacker. That's 2000 euros in your pocket. So to avoid phishing or any of these attacks that I've mentioned here, especially phishing, one thing to do is to check, double check the email address. So if you get an email address that comes from AIB or Bank of Ireland, it looks, has all the colors and all the logos. You tap, if you get this on your phone, you tap into your phone so you can tap the sender, the name of the sender. 100% times you would see that it would, you know, it would have the BOI or the AIB name. But when you tap into see the email URL, it would have something like 45678 or some random weird name at gmail.com. And you should always remember that the banks will never send you any information asking you to verify your details via text messages or via email address. And the same thing for ransomware really is clicking malicious link, being very careful not to click into links that you don't know them. They don't know you. You're not expecting the links. It's, it's literally a case of, do I know this person? You always have to stop and ask yourself, do I know this person? 
And if the answer is no, then don't click the link. And even though you know the person, the second question you should ask yourself is, am I expecting this link from this person? Did I have any conversation that would result in this person sending me this information? So it's it's always like a, a method of stop and think. So most times, especially with social engineering, when they use our emotions like trust or fear, where it says, oh, you know, you're getting your, I don't know, your Revolut ATM, for example, it says you have, you know, credentials on, on Revolut and now it's being used on Amazon. And you're like, I didn't make any purchase on Amazon. I myself, I've gotten a call from someone saying my Revolut card was being used on Amazon. And I know that I didn't make any purchase on Amazon. And I know that my Revolut card had expired. So I knew obviously that they were scammers. But think of if I had made a purchase on my Amazon account using my Revolut card, that would make me think, oh my God, maybe you know it's my password that's not going to come. So you always have to stop and think and just make sure that you're actually consuming the right information from the right person. And it takes nothing to just place a phone call to say, did you send me this email? Did you send me this text message? Just you know, to be safe and to be careful. So let's go to the next slide. So how does cybersecurity impact you or me in this case? Um, three years ago, some may say the country was in shambles because of our healthcare system. Um, I know a number of people that would say the same as well. And while the HSE is not a traditional business, the HSE is a key public health service in Ireland. And they were affected by a cyber breach um, back in May of 2021. And a ransom attack was what led to the shutdown of the complete IT systems of our healthcare system in Ireland. And this caused significant disruptions. Um, I remember I had a friend and she was due to give birth in May. And I remember she was told to come in two days later than her scheduled admission date. And she had mentioned that when she walked into the, off, the, the hospital, it was more or less like back in the 90s where everyone used pen and paper to sign people in and all the documents, everything was being taken into um, into into the you know the manual way of writing names and documenting. So you can think of the fact where she gives birth and instead of the data being put into the system, it's been written on paper. There's a risk that that paper could be missing as well. That's what happened to the, the, the Irish healthcare system three years ago. And this attack resulted into the postponement of thousands of medical appointments and operations. So think of if you were in that situation where you had a loved one that was waiting for an operation and due to the systems being completely shut down, your loved one could not have their surgery. The fear, the, the anguish, just the, the uncertainty at that time, that's how ransomware or a cyber attack can impact me or you as an individual. We could say, oh, well, it's a business that got hacked. Well, as a result of that as well, the citizens and the people that live in Ireland have had their data exposed, their text message, their te text number, phone numbers, email addresses, date of birth. Think of all the personal information that you provide to your healthcare service, you know, the hospitals that you go to. And then think of that information being in the hands of an unsuspecting, unauthorized user. That's the impact of cybersecurity attacks to people like me and you. Phishing attacks, as I mentioned, they have grown over 220%, more frequent since the pandemic. The, 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 it's not, it's not going to stop. It's only going to go higher and higher. Um, phishing is one of the easiest ways to get into, you know, to get unauthorized data or to get into someone's system. You know, according to the anti-phishing working group, they said phishing attacks soared over 220% in between 2020 to 2021. That's one year. We don't even have the current data as of today because it's still growing. And this is primarily to cyber attacks and cyber criminals exploiting the chaos that the global pandemic brought in. Think of the vaccine emails that you must have gotten, you know, the 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 propaganda is around the 5G and how that is contributing to the pandemic and all the stories are around, you know, even the elections that have happened in different parts of the world since the pandemic. The rise is over 300,000 reported phishing attempts in 2021. That's just reported. That's not phishing attempts that were not reported or phishing incidents that were not reported. So the reported ones is 300. I can tell you that that number is over half a million. 
as of today. And many of these attacks are targeting individuals like me and you. They're targeting small business, they're targeting bigger businesses, and they're targeting us through fraudulent websites. Um, about 10 years ago, you could go to www.facebook without the double O, so book, B-O-K dot com, and it will open a completely different landing page that looks exactly like Facebook. And a lot of people had their data stolen because typos are things that we are mistakes that we make when we write with pens, when we type on our digital devices, we make typos. So typos are another way that even these attackers are able to leverage and you know clone a website for it to look exactly the same. Today, now there are measures in place to be able to protect you know, websites that are very popular like facebook.com or amazon.com where an attacker is unable to clone them. But at the same time, we still have so many websites that don't have those capabilities and attackers are still able to clone them. So we should always watch out for even things like PayPal. So if you wanna go, if you have a PayPal account, make sure that you're using the right URL for PayPal. Make sure you're using the right URL for your Netflix account and make sure you're using the right URL for your Apple account as well. Business victims are suffering um, from, from the, you know, the rising cost of data breaches. Um, as of today, <laughs> the cost of a data breach is over 4.35 million U US dollars. I don't know that figure for Europe. I don't know the figure for Ireland specifically, but these are just reported data breaches. And this is how much it is costing companies. Some small companies, especially the small, medium-sized companies, are now at fear of being bankrupt because they cannot afford to protect themselves from cyber and data breaches, especially when it comes to things like ransomware or phishing. And ransomware is getting real rampant now that in just half a year, this year, there's been over 2,000 complaints of ransomware, and these complaints have resulted in 16.8 million losses. These are revenue losses for these businesses. And some of these businesses are businesses that had the right technologies in place. They had some people in place, but at the same time, they were still able to fall for things like ransomware where their data was encrypted. And as a result of that, they had to start from scratch. And since then, They've been record. They've been a record of sixty-two percent increase in the reporting, and also a twenty percent increase in the in the losses compared to the time frame of twenty twenty. So in this case, then we're finding out that the attack vector for ransomware is growing, and one of the ways that ransomware happens again, back to phishing. Phishing is always very easy. Send a link. You click on the link. You can get a link from your Facebook contact saying, oh, I played this game and I won, I don't know, a thousand euros. Or they invite you on WhatsApp to, you know, to win something. And you click on the link and then all your data gets downloaded. All your contacts get shared. And sometimes you even lose access to your WhatsApp. It's actually possible to clone your WhatsApp message and replicate it on a different device. So we just have to be very cautious. Cybercrime is affecting us personally. Um, has anyone received the hi mom or hi dad? I lost my phone text message scam. If you have, please put in the in the in the chat for me. Okay. Someone said their sister has received it. Oh, your mom did as well. Okay, so it's not great but I'm sure you know how scary that is. Um, you're a parent, you receive a text message saying, hi mom, I lost my phone, I'm in jail. Or hi dad, I lost my phone and I'm being held up somewhere. These scams have grown massively in Ireland, across the world as well. Bank of Ireland had to issue a warning last year, July of 2023, telling their their, their, you know, their customers to be careful of these scams. Most times it, it leads to hi son, or, you know, say for example, your son's name is Daniel and you get a hi mom, I lost my phone. And then your mom, you, the mom replies, Daniel, is this you? And it's like, yes, mom, it's me, it's Daniel. 
but it's not Daniel. It's probably John or Mark or someone that doesn't even live in Ireland. But they have this sophisticated technology now that allows them to text, you know, to send massive text messages. Sometimes you could be a man and you get the high mom and you're like, okay, probably a mistake. But then think of the many moms that are moms that get these text messages and fall for them. And you may be wondering, how did they get my, my phone number? It goes back to data breach. It goes back to how cybersecurity attacks affect me and you, you know, as individuals. We give our data to these organizations. We give our data to Facebook. We give our data to, you know, the HSC. And then those companies get hacked. And as a result, data is stolen. The data belongs to us. They are personal data. And then when they get stolen, they get sold on the deep web. When they get sold on the deep web, these cyber criminals then take that data and then perpetrate these kind of attacks. So we're seeing more and more. In 2021, a Dublin victim had a Dublin resident had fell victim to a sophisticated phishing scam. And that resulted in them losing thousands, several thousands of euros. And this individual had said that they received a conniving email address that appeared to be from their bank, prompting them to enter their personal information to be able to resolve a problem on the account. Once the scammers get access to your data, it's always very easy for them to just quickly transfer the money because you've basically given them every single information that they need to be able to log into your account. Again, how do you protect yourself from things like that? Making sure that you don't share your details for your bank, also enabling two-factor authentication, you know, making sure that the text message either comes to your phone or it goes to your email. And that way you can verify, or if you've been if you've mistakenly given your data to a fake website, when you get that notification saying, Are you the person trying to log in? You know you're not trying to log in. So you click no, I'm not. And that automatically blocks them from doing anything. And you have the opportunity to change your passwords. So what am I trying to say here? We have to be careful. We have to stop and think. We have to make sure that we verify with the individuals that are trying to text us when they're in trouble or when they're, you know, when they're scared. We just have to make sure that they they are, you know, aware. And again, one of the sad things about text messages that are phishing is that it affects people that are not technology focused. So let's think about grandparents. You know, I'm sure if my if my if my grandmom got a message saying I was in jail, she would do anything, literally anything. So what do we do? We educate. Education is key. Telling our parents that, you know, these are the kind of attacks that are happening now and they need to be very careful about it will help, you know, um, word of mouth or spreading spreading the information about how to stay cybersecurity conscious. Again, it's also very key for people that are not always on the internet like us or always on our phones, getting this information. It's very important for us to educate the elderly people and as well as ourselves as well. So we've talked about all the cyber issues now. We've talked about the fact that cybersecurity is something that should concern the folks and the likes of me and you. But then there's a problem. And the problem is that we don't have enough people in the world, not just in Ireland, but we don't have enough people in the world to help us fight these cyber crimes. And that's the biggest issue with cybersecurity. One of the comments said complex. It is complex, but it's not that complex. Um, it's not it's not as complex as we think it should be. Currently, there's about 3.4 million scale shortage of people across the world. And Businesses are suffering and are unable to hire. Multiple organizations, including the World Economic Forum, have reported that in the next 10 years, if we don't fill up, this number is going to go way above. So currently, it's over 3 million. But then they're saying that if we don't train, if we don't develop the next generation, we're going to continue to have this. So think of the the rise in cybercrime, the rise in cyber attacks, and then we don't have enough people to help to fight those crimes. It's, it's going to impact you. It's going to impact me. A significant 
62% of increase companies in Ireland, they say they want to hire people. So a lot of companies have made commitments since 2021 about hiring, bringing their cybersecurity workforce to Ireland. Ireland is slowly but surely becoming that cybersecurity hub in Europe, thanks to Brexit. And despite that high demand, 48% of cybersecurity roles in Ireland still remain unfilled. 48%, that's almost 50%. So you can talk to different companies that you're aware of and they will tell you, oh yeah, we've been trying to hire this role for over a year now and we haven't found the right person or we can't find the people or we don't have the skills. And a report from Cyber Ireland, um, an official organization in Ireland here, said that from now we need an additional 1,000 professionals to enter the job market in Ireland from today to be able to keep up with the growing demand of cybersecurity as an industry in Ireland. Do we have 1,000 professionals? I don't think we do. Can we have them? It's 100% possible to have them. So why is cybersecurity important for schoolgirls? The next 10 years, we're supposed to see at least 17,000 open roles in Ireland. That's the prediction from Cyber Ireland's report in 2022. Again, this goes back to the increasing amount of roles that are growing in Ireland. I used to live in Cork a few years ago, and Cork, it has loads of companies. Um, Salesforce is in Dublin, and they recently moved to a new building, Massive, not too far from the Central Bank of Ireland building. That's another international company that is growing. So there are loads of companies in Ireland that are growing, loads and loads of companies. They're looking for cybersecurity professionals. They want to train the cybersecurity professionals. So Ireland needs to be ready for this growth. And by educating school girls, we're not just reducing the gender gap in the industry, but we're also preparing the next generation for the workforce in Ireland. And if this doesn't happen, these companies will take their cyber roles elsewhere. I say this because I've had friends that have left this country and moved to the Netherlands to work for other companies. And I don't wanna to continue to lose friends to other companies because these companies are moving cyber roles away from, from Ireland because they can't find that skilled work person. So, this is where Cyber for School Girls comes into play. And Cyber for School Girls, we're partners and we're affiliated with an organization called ISACA. ISACA is a global organization and we recently were adopted as the official non for profit for building the next generation of women in cybersecurity in Ireland. What's our mission? Our mission really is to be able to give school girls this fulfilling careers in cybersecurity and to be able to empower them with the right skills for them to succeed in their careers and in the future. And our vision as well, again, building the next generation of professional women and also reducing the gender gap, the gender gap in the industry. And you may ask, why are we focusing on girls? We've had that question a number of times. Women make up only 24% of the workforce in cybersecurity globally. So you can think of how many countries exist in the universe on earth. And you can think of the numerous continents that we have, the numerous companies across. And then you see the number 24%. Women only make up 24%. I can give you my own personal story. I come from a very traditional background. I had an engineering degree in my bachelor's. I had an engineering degree in my first master's and then I have a management master's as well. And in my first two master's, I was the only woman in the room. In my bachelor's, I was the only woman in the room. And I met a few women in my, in my master's. A few of them dropped out. A few of us graduated until the end. For the first three years of my career, I was the only woman in the room working with a room full of men. So again, one could say I'm in a male dominated field. But I'm trying to change that story. And it's very important for me and the other women that I work with to change the story. Because I don't want to be the only woman in the room 10 years from now. Women are, you know, missing this opportunity, not intentionally, because 
there's a lot of societal you know history there as to why lots of women that were part of the computer engineering society in the 90s fell out in the in the 20, in, in the 2000s and as the year progressed so here are a few members of our organizations here um we're currently a team of 18 working professionals and we're made up of different areas in our careers we have technology professionals on the team we have cybersecurity professionals we also have educators and with a combined team of 18 people we have over 16 years combined experience and i would say that it's just an amazing group of people that we have we have on our team and um i'll tell you you could ask the question of how do we start what do we do about this issue that we're having with the skill shortage and also the gender gap in cybersecurity. So how are we gonna start? We start with three things here. We have selected three key core skills that we believe that would help and shape the next generation of women in cybersecurity. And you may be wondering, how do we build these core skills? Well, here are five suggestions. First, cross-disciplinary approach in subjects like computer science and social studies. You can integrate cybersecurity concepts into subjects like computer science and even social science as well. So for example, if you're teaching the kids about data privacy laws within social studies, or even applying mathematical principles to encryption in computer science, contextualizing it in simpler forms on how it applies. So remember what I said, how does cybersecurity concern you? How does it impact me? We're individuals, right? We don't, we're not companies. We don't own billions and millions of Naira or revenue in the bank. But then when our data gets into the wrong hands, our, ourselves as individuals and our families suffer because those cyber criminals would then use that data that we've entrusted in these companies against us. So in the end, what the receiving end. So that's how it's important to be able to contextualize how cybersecurity works and how it applies to even down to teenagers in your classrooms. You could also start an after school club that can offer elective courses solely on cybersecurity. So students can engage in things like competitions and there's something called capture the flag. So basically it's about problem solving skills and critical thinking. And that's one of the two core skills that you need to be able to grow in cybersecurity you need to be a critical thinker and you need to be able to solve problems. You need to ask questions and solve problems. The school, again, can also leverage online platforms. There are loads of free courses, loads of free training materials that you, know, you can focus on. You don't even have to be the one offering those courses to the students. You can just provide them with that information, give them the ability to think and to question themselves Again, this would engage them and this would help them, you know, to think, okay, well, what can I do in my, in my spare time? Rather than always being on TikTok or Snapchat, I could actually take a course, you know, learn something new, find out more about cyber safety or cyber bullying and how to protect myself. So that's one way that the school can encourage this. Again, you can also conduct workshops for the students, educating them on online safety, you know, also teaching them about password management and how to protect your passwords. We talked about making sure you don't share things like your password and your credentials. But then it's not enough to have passwords now. You have to have something called multi-factor authentication. So you authenticate with what you know, and then you authenticate with what you have. And what you have is your mobile device because what you know is your password, but what you have is the code that goes to your mobile device. So it's not just enough to put in your password. You have to have a second layer of protection. And again, a lot of the students, especially the school girls that are on the internet, on websites like TikTok and Snapchat, most of them just have their passwords and their passwords are just only attached to things like their pet's name, their mom's name, their dad's name. There is no security there. So being able to bring online safety practices into the classroom, teaching them of password management, recognizing phishing attempts when they go online to shop, or even the importance of even just updating your phone. You get software updates on your phone, on your mobile device, on your laptops. Practicing basic cybersecurity hygiene is another way that the school can encourage the students, especially the school girls, to be able to, you know, 
get around it. Fostering, a, you know, a culture of awareness is very important as well. You know, making sure that October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's amazing that I'm talking to you. Bring this back into the classroom. Tell the students about cybersecurity by saying, well, yeah, we're in the classroom. But you know what's interesting today is it's the 1st of October. We're in October. It's Cybersecurity Awareness Month. What does that mean? How do you practice good cybersecurity hygiene? So that's one way that you can do it as a teacher, a principal, or a school professional. So you can also invest in online hands-on training. And you may be wondering, well, I can't do this all by myself. It seems like a lot. This is where Cyber, Cyber for School Girls comes into play. We're great at doing things like this. So what do we do really? We engage students with online learning, giving them a bit of you know, a taste of what it feels like to work in the industry. We also invite guest speakers um, like I am today you know, bringing in guest speakers to encourage the school, the, the, the school girls to, you know, learn about security through other experiences. I've heard that if you cannot see it, most times you can't be it. So bring in different inspiring women and men in front of them to say, well, these are the careers of these women. Loads of our team members didn't start quite traditional. Some of them met cybersecurity 10 years into their career, and they've been in cybersecurity for 15 years. So that's again, another story to give the girls to say, well, there are lots of women in, cyber, in cybersecurity and there are lots of women in leadership positions. Those women want you in their office. Those women want you in the office, in, 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 in the office. Encouraging again, them to use free resources. And again, there are lots of free resources. The Google Coursera is free. Um, there are different levels as well. Cisco also offers you know, summer trainings to ages 11 to 18. That's another, you know, amazing resource that the school girls could be exposed to. So again, at Sarah for School Girls, we're very good at this. And we've done a couple of these events at some schools. And I'll tell you about them. Kingswood Community College was the first school that we went into. And it's a mixed school, but they gave us access and granted us audience to their girls because again, our mission is to reduce that gender gap and increase the number of women in cybersecurity, not just across the world, but specifically in Ireland. Because again, we don't want the girls to feel like they don't belong here and then they go chase their career somewhere else. So what did we do at Kingswood? We ran different workshops, vision exercise, um, as what you can see the girls doing on with in, in the photo below on their pen and their paper is they're identifying phishing emails. And we tailored the phishing emails to things that they'll be very familiar with, like HM websites, River Island websites, all the websites that they will go to shop. We basically gave them three different emails and we asked them to identify what was legitimate and what wasn't. And it was a surprise to us because about 95% of the girls identified the emails correctly. And I said to them, they did better than loads of my colleagues in the office, because again, we run phishing emails every month. And most times even working professionals fall for this. So it gave us an insight into the way the girls are thinking and how they have critical thinking as part of a skill. So what do we do as teachers and what do we do as industries? We develop and we build on that. And we tell them, well, your, you know, you have a good attention to detail. This is how you can utilize this for your future. We also showed them some hacking techniques as well. And the feedback that we got from them is less talking, more hacking. So there is that interest there. We just need to be able to build the interest and develop that interest for the students. We also went to Stanhope Community College as well. And we ran similar workshops. Here we also identified you know, some of the cybersecurity riddles and basically solved the case of a missing prof of a missing pro professor. And they solved the case of the missing professor by reading phishing emails and also using their critical thinking skills to be able to answer the question. So again, investing in school girls is something that we're really passionate about. And we believe in developing that interest and giving them real world examples would take their brain and their interest in the next level. I wish I wish is a school 
um, education exhibition. I don't know if anyone on the call has participated in the I Wish, but I Wish brings together over 3,000 girls from across the country you know, for a whole day of session. And we were at the I Wish this year, 2024, and we ran something called the Escape Room. And basically the Escape Room, if you can look at the photo there, it's a lock and it's a key. And there are riddles that you're supposed to solve and open the box. And if you open the box, you get a key to open, to solve the next riddle, to open another box. And basically this again is improving on their critical and problem solving skills. They have, you know, riddles in front of them. They have ciphers in front of them and we ask them to decipher it. So I get back to the whole point of educating the girls, building that interest in cybersecurity, following them up. What we do with the schools is we don't do a once or visit and we leave. We try to build a relationship because we want to see these girls again and we want them to, we want them to see us again. And we also want them to ask us questions. So maybe our first visit, they're not very comfortable asking certain questions. And then we come back again for more workshop and then they ask questions. And that interest just keeps building and building and building. And then the whole aim is we want these girls to take up third level degrees in Ireland, studying cybersecurity related courses, studying technology related courses, and then we prepare them for the workforce. One of the benefits of our team is the fact that we all work in different organizations, small, medium sized, multinational American companies. And we would have the opportunity to be able to bring these girls in for TY experiences, for internships when they're in universities, basically mentoring them until they become full-grown working professionals in the world. And that's the whole aim um, for what we do. Uh, thank you. Um, I hope this was insightful for you. I hope that this was clear. And um, I'm open to questions now. So I will look at the chat and then we can go from there. Blessing, just before we jump into the Q&A session, thank you so much. That was really informative and it was so great to hear about the 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 cyber the cyber for school girls as well. It was really interesting. Um, and just to let everyone know as well that uh, Blessing will also be speaking at Crow Park on the 15th um, at the, of October um, at the Cyber Security Summit. So keep an eye out for updates from that as well. So we'll hop right into the Q&A session then. So I think I saw our first question um, and it was from Mag saying, is a data leak rather than a breach from outside the company through a mistake of humor and covered on the cybersecurity head and all it's just bad practice? Hmm, data leak. Well, a data leak starts from human beings, believe it or not. And um, there's something called patient zero. And there's always, they always ask who is the patient zero. So what was the first point of entry? A data leak most times happens through the result of human error. And I'll give you an example, um, an example of a data leak, for example. So you so you have a, you know, you have your mobile device, maybe you use an Apple, maybe you use an Android, and you get a notification that says you should update your mobile device. But then you ignore it. And you ignore it. And the main purpose of you know being told to update your mobile device is because there is now a vulnerability in that version that currently exists. As a result of you ignoring it, if say six months later, someone sends you a, you know, a phishing email or a phishing link and you click on that, you will not be aware, but then they will be exploiting the vulnerability that already exists on the older version. So as a result of you not updating your mobile device, that attack that comes in six months later will then work on your device. But think of the other side of things. If you had updated your mobile device, when you click on that link, because you have the latest software update, whatever you know, security breach practice, whatever it is that they have sent through that link will not function on your phone. So you could be seen as a patient zero. The HSC attack was as a result of someone clicking the phishing link. They got the link via an email, they clicked on it, and as a result, the whole country was in lockdown because our healthcare system was down. So it is bad practice, but it also always starts from an individual. So I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, I'm still very happy to clarify as well. Yeah, I, I was thinking of lack of practice as opposed to bad practice in schools, all sorts of places where people just out of no, no, not even stupidity, just ignorance are doing things badly 
and data is getting flung all over the place where it shouldn't where it shouldn't go like i always think we think about the cybersecurity stop the bad stuff coming in but actually i don't think i honestly would not say in irish schools we are half trained close to where we close to where we should be i agree with you i 100 percent agree with you um Unfortunately, people people leave the small things out. And the small thing is really the hygiene. You know, it's always the very smallest things. Every time you hear of a massive social, you know, social media bridge or a company bridge and the revenue that has been lost, and then you hear what happened, you're like, so someone forgot to change the password, you know, like things like that. Take for example Uber. Uber has been bridged, I don't know, three times now. I'm I'm losing count. And the Uber bridge that happened two years ago was as a result of the previous breach that happened back in 2016. And you would not, like you would think of Uber, it's a huge company, right? So they should have the right practice. But then an attacker was able to go to the black market, buy some passwords from a breach that happened in 2016. And they were able to test those passwords in the two in the 2000s and the, you know, 2021, they were able to test the password that was breached in 2016 and it worked. That is basic cybersecurity hygiene, as simple as resetting your passwords. And trust me, companies feel that, unfortunately, the educational system even suffers more because they don't have the bigger budgets to train the employees and to train the staff and to put all the, you know, all the right fancy technologies in place to make sure that they can stop. So the onus then is on the individual to make sure that they can protect themselves, protect their students and protect their data. Thanks, Blessing, thank you. Do we have um, any more questions, um, Jennifer? I'm just trying to go through the the link here. Yeah, we do. We have lots of other questions there. I just popped in myself earlier they, there saying, what do you think is the biggest barrier to entry for secondary school students? Do you think it's interest or do you think it's maybe lack of awareness? I think it's a bit of both. Um, unfortunately, we live in a shortest attention span, you know, where you have to... I don't know, be loud, use fancy graphics to capture. I think even adults as well suffer from, you know, the the, the attention span. But I think it's a mixture of the, the lack of interest and also the awareness. But the lack of interest goes towards a case where the, you know, the students are being, I would say, attracted by something other than education. So one of our goals really is to push third level degrees because we want to see more people in universities and although some companies are trying to break down that barrier of, you know, not needing a BSc to be able to get into the workforce, we still see more companies that will lean towards, you know, hiring someone that has shown that they can start and finish a project, which, for example, a bachelor's degree in this case, mm -hmm. you know, as a more trustworthy person to bring into their workforce, because that person then shows that they're trainable and that they can improve. Um, awareness again comes in where a lot of the students that we've spoken to, they don't know much about cybersecurity. The word that comes to mind is hacking. You know, they think mm -hmm. cybersecurity is all about hacking and hacking as a bad guy, but not necessarily protecting the data. I try to simplify it for the girls when we go in to say, well, your data on your mobile device, my job is to make sure that when an application is being built, that that application is built with security in mind. So when you put in your data, it's stored well, it's stored securely and someone cannot access it. So I think the awareness and, and you know, especially going down to the, the guiding counselor routes as well, you know, them proposing technology, proposing cybersecurity as a lucrative career path for the girls, I think is where the awareness is lacking and where it can mm -hmm. improve as well. Mm -hmm. And then I think, too, as you mentioned earlier on about contextualizing it, seeing how it kind of, you know, how it affects them and at a local level and what that would look like it is important, too. Um, yeah. So Marielle also had a question there. Um, she mentioned that it's fantastic for students to have workshops in cybersecurity run by people who work in the industry, which we absolutely agree with. Um, and she's wondering what the feedback from the students has been. And has Anthony maybe surprised you in particular? One thing that surprised me um, at Kingswood were the fact that someone had mentioned VPN when I asked the question of what, you know, what comes to, to, to mind when you hear the word cyber. VPN wasn't really what I was expecting for some reason. <laughs> but it was really good to hear VPN because that means two things. They're either protecting themselves or they're going to websites that they shouldn't be going to. But at the same time, 
they already have technology in mind and they know how technology can work for them. The, the, the main feedback that we've heard, because we do um, a bit of presentation as well, where we get different people on the team to talk about their stories. When we showed the girls how to spoof an email address, everyone had their phones down and they were all looking at the screen. And basically spoofing an email address is basically blessing sending an email address, but using Jennifer's email. So you think Jennifer sends you an email. And that was very interesting because that was hacking. So what we try to do, especially when we look at the age range that we provide this workshop to, is that we think of ways that would interest them and strike up more, you know, more, more curiosity while at the same time educating them. So it's like, yeah, we show them a bit of hacking, but then we show them how that applies in real world and also explain to them that that's not all it takes. Like it's, you know, it's it's huge and it's massive. You know, there's so much. I've 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 been fortunate to work in different aspects of cybersecurity and I currently don't do hacking, but now I protect my organization from hackers because I know the kind of data that we have and I know that hackers have been interested in that data. So I, I think it's, you know, it's it's kind of like a mix of both where, you know, they they want to learn, but they want to learn with their hands. So now we're trying to bring in more workshops where we can get them busy with their hands. We can get them busy doing things where it's not just all talking to them, but then they're also participating in the workshop. Brilliant. Can I follow I up just quickly? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm aware that there's a great range of technology going on in schools. And it surprises me sometimes that I'll I'll be I'll come across a school that's got one set of laptops for everybody. And most of them don't work, so they're not used very often. And then you've got other schools where everything's done on iPads. And I'm just wondering with regard to the workshops, like does this does that impact how you're able to deliver the workshop? You know, does the tech capacity of the school um, is that a barrier in any way or are you able to compensate for that with the equipment that you're able to bring or I'm just wondering how you mitigate that? That's a really good question. In fact, that's an amazing question because the two examples of schools that we visited that I showed you, that, yeah, we experienced that. So back in 2022, when we went to Kingswood Community College, we turned out that everyone uses an iPad, fancy, easy delivery, amazing, smooth sailing. And then we, we went to Stanhope and um, yeah, they had one laptop and uh, the laptop didn't work just at the moment we were about to start. So we had to improvise and it wasn't easy. Um, I think I think that was a really good experience for us because our ours, we had this idea that it's laptop is the bare minimum. You know, we would be able to, we come with our laptops, but of course, we, you know, we will get... The, the students to have laptops and it was a you know it was a bit of a shock for us but then it 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 made us learn that okay our idea of what we think exists within the schools don't exist and you know we made it work in in Stanhope um there was a very old projector where we had to close all the blinds to be able to see <laughs> and all the girls had to come you know join their seats together and you know we just basically had to just look all, all look at one screen. But what we've done with that is that we've gone back and we've re-strategized and we've reprogrammed the workshops that we now deliver. And it would work if it's on a mobile phone. It would work if it's on an iPad. It would work if it's on, you know, a, a laptop. It would work. And next week, um, the team is driving up to Letterkenny and we're partnering with a company called PGIM in Letterkenny. We have about seven schools that will be coming into the company in 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 Letterkenny and all the girls are coming with their mobile devices. There's not going to be any laptops from the yeah. school because these are, you know, different schools bringing girls together. We don't have 25 laptops for 25 girls that will be coming yeah. next week. So our programs will be run on their phones and the company would provide the Wi-Fi. So as long as you have a mobile device on you, whether it's an Apple, whether it's an Android, you will be able to, you know, participate in the workshop. So our experience two years ago was a real reminder for us to, you know, make sure that we have our programs accessible and not think that every school will be iPad friendly as we had experienced the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Has anybody else any questions there? Because I, I, I would agree with Kate there, just noticing that we are coming up close to, to nine and I am very appreciative of everyone giving their time to attend tonight. Do we have any other questions now? 
Oh, okay. So I'll just say a final thank you then uh, on behalf of Ceci and everyone. Um, again, thank you, Blessing, so much for that. That was really informative. And um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you so much. And we will... Um, we will we'll share email details and that if you'd like to send on maybe any details of your, your workshops to the participants, that would be fantastic. Yes, no, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, it was a pleasure and uh, I look forward to talking to you and, and hopefully running our workshop in your schools in the future. That'd be super. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, right, just... Go on.